Larry Fessenden, for those out of the loop, is indie horror royalty. From the vampiric genius of habit to his recently released modern portrayal of the Frankenstein tale, Depraved, Larry has poured his passion onto the small screen for over 30 years. You may recognize him from roles acting alongside Jodie Foster or Ron Perlman, but the initiated know Larry is a real artist, a successful mentor to many recognizable directors and, in the truest sense of the word, a filmmaker. We sat with Larry and dug deep to see what really makes the monster move. I really appreciate the question. Editing is my favorite part of filmmaking. Uh, you know, there's the old cliche that when you write a film, it's one version, and then you remake it when you shoot because you get new input from your collaborators. But really the final and most important and the definitive process is uh, editing. And right. so uh, early on, I had someone edit one of my early features, No Telling. And uh, I just found there was a distance between me and the material. And I really wanted to get involved with the material and have the film speak to me. Um, at the same time, quite honestly, I wanted to uh, edit the movie the way I had pictured it because that was the initial impulse. And, uh, you know, that sort of solves the question of did you make good choices, you know, and, and because I like the idea of designing a film uh, in the mode of Hitchcock or something where you really pre-imagine it. But then things happen, and so that first edit is fun, and you go, okay, well, I got a lot of the things I thought would work, work pretty well, but then you have to let the film speak to you. So I really enjoy editing, and I've edited for other people, Kelly Reichert and... Uh, I often come in, well, as a producer, I come in at the end and talk to the filmmaker and try to jostle their, you know, what they're wed to. Um, I'm not always trying to cut down, you know, I think the idea of pacing is one of the most interesting aspects of filmmaking, especially in contrast to blockbusters, which have a sort of a manic intensity because people now have such a... Uh, short attention span, and you know, they can see a shot that's shorter than a 70s movie. Right. Uh, so all of those things are in play. What I'm getting at is I just find the whole conversation, the whole idea of editing, and of course I love movies with no edits, like Rope, uh, but that's a choice as well. So I appreciate you noticing the editing. Uh, no Telling was conceived of as a very elegant film. I was really excited by the potential. I'd made some more rock and roll films in my youth uh, on the, you know, the streets of New York. I made a movie called Hollow Venus about go-go dancing, uh, but always I'm mindful of, of the frame. To me, that's really what the director does. I know there's some directors who uh, maybe their primary interest is acting, um, but I grew up with the school of Hitchcock where you design the movie and each shot uh, leads to the next and that's to me what's delicious and if you can actually orchestrate something uh, it's thrilling and you know I see scenes as you know the the way you reveal information in a film is the storytelling that's what I learned when I first picked up a Super 8 camera I was like oh my goodness you know if I start with a close-up I'm doing one thing if I start with a wide I'm doing something else so with that in mind that to me is storytelling. Even when I write, maybe you write impulsively at first, you're getting with the dialogue, the atmosphere, but eventually I start crafting the script to indicate what the shots are. So with no telling, I had a, um, uh, a larger crew maybe than I wanted, but at the very least it allowed me to say, this is the concept of the shot and to get it. And there's some wonderful like dollies and uh, yeah. they're really, and you know, shots that lead to others and, and a real construct and even though the film was very uh, naive in its uh, political aspect though I stand by it um, I think that the the shooting of it uh, has real integrity oh yeah I have a sign that said uh, over 50 distributors didn't know how to market this movie. They must think you're pretty stupid. 
first of all, I never got into the, any festivals of note. I did show at the Chicago Film Festival, which was a wonderful experience, and that was my world premiere. But I admit that I was trying to get into Sundance, and you know, I didn't. Uh, and then I didn't really get into a lot of uh, renowned festivals where you're bound to make a sale. And, uh, and then I started just sending it to companies. And I guess it sat on the desk and, you know, I could have been wrong in my approach, but I just felt sort of desperate. I thought I'd made a good movie. And a year into this, uh, the same guy, Charles Coleman from Chicago, who had seen the movie there, uh, who ran a, a theater called Facets, which was actually a multimedia, they had a video store. He said, do you want to just show it here? And uh, that's, I said, that's fantastic. Thank you for remembering my film. And uh, that led to a 40 city release that I orchestrated with my friend, Mike Ellenbogen. We basically self-distributed Habit. Um, and it was really great. I would spend all night making the ads for the newspapers and you'd have to decide between one inch and three inch columns and all the money. And um, we opened in New York, LA, Albany, Florida, Austin, uh, all over in Chicago and we started getting good reviews and we uh, really made our own way and then eventually it sold to home video and uh, and has been embraced to some degree as a singular film but uh, it was really a, a do-it-yourself experience and it's it's kind of what made my company the way it is like I would see other filmmakers and say this is um, if your movie's good, we're going to take care of it. This check is going to my crew. They labored tirelessly. I appreciate you asking that. So it was a real, so it was a year of feeling rejected by everyone. Mm -hmm. And that's a long time when you have a movie that you've made and you star in it and you edit it and act it. And, um, and you know, all my crew had worked for uh, deferment. Right. They'd essentially worked for free is the reality of it. I don't even know if I talked about deferment, but I, uh, my producer said, well, let's pay them nothing because they can't say they're being paid, you know, too little. So we made the film. Um, so s sort of halfway into this feeling of complete rejection, I got a phone call from Peter Broderick. He said, there's this thing called the Someone to Watch Award, and it's for a filmmaker who has toiled under the radar for years. And I did feel that was me, even though uh, a lot of my films were even before the features I had made. I'd made uh, independent shorts, and I'd worked for performance artists, and so I really did have a, a crazy body of work where I learned all the filmmaking that I care about. Um, and he said, we'd like to put you up uh, as a nominee, and I was, it was really one of the, I mean, I hate this expression because I'm always like, oh dear, I don't remember having any happy days, but I was happy. Yeah. For a moment, I felt happy. Uh, and it was a really cool feeling. And then actually that's when Charles Coleman called. And so I went to Chicago to premiere Habit and that, it was on a Friday as it would be. And that day I got three amazing reviews, one from Roger Ebert and I felt really good and I hate flying so the irony is I had to get on a red eye mm. and the next day be in Los Angeles uh, to receive the Someone to Watch Award. So it was a really intense jolt. It's funny because I'm so nervous that I don't even construct a proper sentence but I say uh, Erwin Young from my lab in Duart which means uh, the lab Duart uh, I had owed them money because, uh, you know, he very kindly gave me a, a, a cut on the price. He was a great supporter of uh, independent filmmakers, and I was lucky to be one of them. I went in, I pitched the whole thing, and he gave me this uh, great rate. Uh, so in front of the crowd, I said, I'm going to pay my crew, right. um, but don't tell Irwin. And I knew he was right there, and he laughed. This. You pull out your teeth at parties too. I'm uh, mugged. They uh, kicked me in the face. I lost my tooth. They got six bucks off of me. 
No, it wasn't six dollars. They didn't get anything. No, I might have combined two stories, but I was in those days. I would make Super Eight movies and I would project them, and I would have a uh, a boombox, mm -hmm. an old cassette player, and I'd have to push start right at the same moment on the leader so that they were in sync. And it wasn't like it was dialogue, but you know the music and all of that. Right. So I always had a boombox and the movies. Um, and the projector, I guess. Anyway, we were walking home from a party, and my French girlfriend was carrying the boombox, and all these kids came up, and they started hassling her, and they were trying to get the boombox away. This was in front of the Brooklyn Museum. And I turned around and go, hey, guys, what the hell? And they just toof, kicked me in the face and ran off, scurried off like roaches. So the funny thing is that they weren't really meaning that much harm, but it right. was just a sort of a, a sudden burst of uh, youthful energy. And, uh, but I lost my tooth, yeah. and I never put it back. So we had lights, and first of all, I had this great mud makeup. Uh, I really, I loved Coppola's Dracula, and I tried to do it in Depraved. I loved it when the I love it when the monster shifts. It's in Wendigo too. The monster right. seen in different guises. I don't know what it is. For one thing, it in, it suggests the monster may not be real at all, or you know, it's your experience. Even with your friends, some days right. you th they seem really mean to you, and other days they're warm. You know, in other words, uh, life is shape shifting. It's all about perception. So I had in mind that uh, this version of her would be pushing the envelope a little further than just her normal cool look. Um, so she was covered in mud and nude, and she comes in, and then we had lights. We filmed a, a plate just of the room dark. Mm -hmm. Then we back cranked the camera. This was film. And then we uh, would bring up a light like that, and she would do a move. And um, so that's all in camera. The whole idea is I would play him, of course, right. and then he would have a son. I have this friend who um, who has a little five-year-old, and the friend is older than me, so I sort of tracking, like, the story would still be possible. Like, right. he had a kid late. And the reason I want the kid is, A, to contrast it with the, the Sam from the original Habit, uh, but also there's far more tragedy. And uh, this one, what's cool is that the traditional themes of vampirism is, uh, or at least in habit, I'm talking about um, sexual addiction and, and, you know, sort of youth and lust and, and all of that. But now the themes would start shifting to immortality. The other thing a vampire can offer you is to cheat death. So it's fun to imagine. I mean, it seems indulgent to make habit again. Nobody's asking for it. At the same time, uh, there's a couple of films that it reminds me of, that I admire, and that sort of give me the strength to continue to consider it, like Boyhood, you know, movies that play with time. I think every artist is putting out their worldview, whether they want to or not. If they have any control over the medium, you're actually getting um, a sense of who they are. In a way, you know, my regret with Spielberg is he has so much understanding of, of horror and the moments, you know, when the sweater gets caught and, and that's what can be someone's undoing. I mean, he gets that. He has real sense of horror, but he also has these endings, and I can do a whole thesis on the ending of his films are, are troublesome, and that's because he can't quite come to terms with the darkness. Um, I don't really want to uh, torture people, but I do feel a tremendous melancholy, so that's what's in my films, and I can't get away from it. I have this bad review for Depraved that bugs me, because he says, so let me get it straight. You're going to revise Frankenstein, and you, uh, you're proposing that the grave robbers from the original story uh, in an updated version are nothing but jerks. And I'm like, yes, that's what I'm saying. You know, I, you know, there's something glorious about Dr. Frankenstein defying death and everything, but I'm actually saying, you know what? He's kind of a jerk. That's just not what you should be doing. It's my critique of modern...
people uh, is that they're jerks. And obviously the Polidori character is just devoid of integrity. And, and so uh, to that reviewer, I shouldn't highlight him. I mean, fuck him. But uh, it's like, I'm sorry, you just didn't like what I have to say about humanity. I love the Swans. I knew Mike Girard. I knew the bass player. He died. My good friend Harry. Um, they were awesome, and I was going to do a, a rock video with them. We were going to have Girard in a bathtub with, in pig's blood with a pig's head, which is ironic because I was already a vegetarian. But for the arts, you know, you can uh, yeah. <laughs> make exceptions. You know, when I spoke about my early years not quite getting my shit together to be a filmmaker, it's because I was hanging out with those kind of people and really enjoying the New York scene and sort of the authentic street performances. And, and, you know, it was a very inspiring history to have. And people like Steve Buscemi were doing performance art with Mark Boone Jr. And, uh, you know, Jarmish was starting to get his start. And uh, we were all aware of this. Spike Lee was felt like just a, a, I knew his brother and his sister. So, it was a community that was just starting to bubble to the top and you felt like some people were actually going to bust through. And of course, I would sit in the quad cinema and watch Spike Lee's movie and Jarmish and be jealous and think, Aye, arr! The last winter was so exceptional because we filmed in Iceland. Right. Um, the budget went to those fantastic locations. Mm -hmm. They went to a slightly more high profile cast, Ron and Connie Britton and James Legro, Kevin Corrigan, Jamie Harold. I mean, uh, lots of great uh, people. Great and then um, just uh, Iceland, which is a fantastic place, just is oddly expensive because it's an island. Right. So that's where the money went. But I had 34 days, which is, seems like a lot of time. I know that I needed one more day, uh, yeah. but uh, I'm always very humbled by the whole thing and the fact that there's any money at all, so I'm very happy to work with what, what I've got. Very often when there's something in the news about the climate, I will say, uh, watch the last winter. Um, and it is very prescient. It doesn't mean I'm terribly clever. It just means I care about these issues. In fact, that movie, that stuff was being talked about 10 years prior. And I, uh, when I made No Telling, I wrote a book called How to Make uh, Movies Environmentally. And there's a whole section where I say, this global warming thing is a real problem. That was 1990. So once again, it's not that I'm smart, it's that I'm attuned to certain things that are out there right. being talked about by people like Bill McKibben, Al Gore, and so on. If you're making fantasy stories, they're in service to some bigger ideas and you're bound to bump into some truths. That's just, that's your job, and that should be what uh, is your preoccupation, it seems to me. I'm gonna forget his name, but uh, he was an incredible artisan in Iceland who made like sculptures for museums, you know, and uh, our forefathers or whatever, and uh, he made this uh, incredibly beautiful, fully nude version uh, of Maxwell. And, um, and we had a long conversation because I said, I want him to have a circumcised penis. And he was like, oh, I don't know what that is. And then he told me, I went on the porno sites with the men and uh, I see what you want. And so uh, I always tell this story because it's so heartbreaking. So after all of that and putting him through all of this, uh, right at the moment we had the crane shot, I like poured snow on the crotch because I was like, oh, what, the, what, what rating will I get? So I regret that I had this great idea of this naked figure in the snow with his circumcised penis and uh, I, it was all... I, so the, the naked director got coy. <laughs> exactly. One thing I always say is, especially when I was starting to produce stuff, is um, these are sometimes movies that I wouldn't actually make, but I love and I want to see made. Mm -hmm. And so I, it's a real vicarious pleasure. Plus, I do get to lord over people and give them my theories of filmmaking. And, uh, and of course, people like Ty West don't particularly listen, but we had a tremendous 
rapport and um, similar sensibility. Graham Resnick and uh, and you know someone like Mickey Keating, I just admired his uh, his craft. You know more so than maybe his themes, but his craft I found really uh, enlightening. And then a movie like Like Me. Um, once again, I just these are singular artists with a real burning desire to tell a certain type of story, and it's probably one I wouldn't tell, but uh, it's a great privilege to feel like you're helping them up the mountain. Anna Asensio, I mean, she was trying to make that movie for years. She made uh, Most Beautiful Island, and um, she was very deliberate and specific. She wanted to shoot film. She wanted long takes, and it was wonderful to... I just enjoy... Uh, talking about movies uh, with people who really care and who are building something of their own and you can help them along and listen. It's about listening to what they are saying they want and then you say, let's just make sure, let's look at it this way, like maybe that prearranged thought needs a little bit of, of help. I try to set up movies so that the filmmaker can find their organic rhythms as well. Try to give them space. For example, Jim Mickle on Stakeland. He shot at his father's house in Maryland, uh, this whole par early part of the film. And then uh, there was this idea of like a season change. So the movie really had some depth to it in a sense of like these guys have been out there among the vampires for, for a long time. So we said, well, let's take a month off. We'll come back in the fall. It'll really feel different. And we'll shoot upstate, a little further north. And so we did that. And while he took the time off, he was able to look at the material, and the second half was stronger. Uh, same with Glenn McQuaid. We took time off to wait for Ron Perlman's uh, availability. So we shot half the movie. Now, these are things you can do if you are sort of uh, overseeing the financing and, and uh, you know, if, if it's bonded or if there's a real company one of the first rules is don't finish half a movie. That is insane. Uh, so it's something you can only do if you have sort of your own shop and your own set of rules. Um, very lucky to be able to bring people into that world. Well, when I was little, there was no VHS or Blu-rays or any way to revisit movies. And because I like to draw and usually was working with my hands, making models and things, uh, I always like to listen to uh, old time radio. But I got it in mind that I could record movies on cassette off the television. And uh, I started doing that and I really appreciated the rhythm of the sounds that tell the story. And I, I know some movies just by their sound and like the, the footsteps that lead to the car door opening and closing or the random, you know, siren sound after a line. And I, in my mind, those were things that were actually affecting my experience. And I took that uh, all the way up to uh, Jaws I recorded in the theater and I missed the beginning of Quint's speech. So I only know, I know the whole speech, but only <laughs> from a certain part. Anyway, um, it was really uh, the way I, love to revisit movies um, before there was uh, home home entertainment systems. And then um, my friend Paul, his mother told us the story of Dracula around the fire um, and she told the whole story with great detail. I feel like we came back a couple of times to have a the continuation. And it was just, it's a very uh, seared into my memory this this experience and I was terrified and delighted and, and just always loved uh, storytelling. I feel like the movies I saw as a kid that inspired me, I'm still nurturing uh, my love of those movies and still nourished by them. We spoke of The Mist, I really love The Mist. I wish it was better regarded but maybe it's cool when a movie is just um, out there and it's for the few who love it. I'm almost at a loss because I always say the same movies. I mean, I like angst. Uh, I like irreversible. If you want to talk about, you know, really hardcore movies that I think are absolutely belong on the shelf, uh, 
Man Bites Dog. I'm now speaking of particularly extreme films, but that's sort of my level of extreme cinema. Like I don't, um, I don't flock to uh, gore movies. Dead of Night is a great anthology film that finally came out on Blu-ray, so I recommend that to your uh, listeners and viewers because it's a very charming, um, like Tales from the Crypt. It's a series of stories, but the wraparound story is really haunted. It's it's a cool movie, and now it's available. It wasn't for a long time. I was just thinking how much I love The Fly by Cronenberg. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, these are all, most people have seen them, but it's fun to remind yourself that there's certain films you can always go back to, and what a refreshing experience that is. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for talking with us. Thank you, Bobby.